Dr. David, this is Ragya. Thank you so much for being here with me today. I'm very happy to have you here. Uh, before we start talking about your research work on Origin of Life, can you please tell me that when you decided that you want to work on Origin of Life, how that Origin of Life is one of the big questions that one can ever ask, right? So how and when you decided that, okay, this is something that interests me and this is something that I would want to spend my whole life working on? Good. That goes back to a sabbatical leave I had in England in 1975. There is a scientist there named Alec Bangham, and he was working at the animal physiology student uh, unit uh, just south of Cambridge, England. It's a place called Babraham. So my family and I rented a house in Cambridge, and every morning I would take one of those big red double-decker buses, uh, maybe a 10-minute ride to get down to Babraham. Alec, in 1965, published the first paper having to do with what we now call liposomes. Liposomes are small vesicles that you can make from certain kinds of lipids, such as phospholipid from egg yolk, that was what he was using at the time, uh, and it turns out that the phospholipid can self-organize into beautiful membranous structures. And Alec was the first to realize that the self-assembly of phospholipids into membranes was the way that all membranes of life on Earth originated, and in fact are still uh, being used by cells today. So you have 100 trillion cells in your body, every one of them has a nice little phospholipid membrane around it, separating the cell from the external environment. And it contains, of course, the contents of the cell, the nucleus and then plasma reticulum and ribosomes, all that stuff that you and I use. But even bacteria, even bacteria have um, this material inside a compartment made of a phospholipid membrane. So it's obvious to me and to Alec Bangham, that life must have begun with something that could self-assemble from the environment. Because there was no enzymes. There's nothing to make phospholipids. There had to be something there, but nobody had ever asked how that came about, okay? Yeah. So I went back to my home campus, the University of California at Davis, and in 1977, I had a very fine graduate student named Will Hargreaves arrive, and he was interested in this question as well. So as a graduate student, he decided to work on how membranes could have self-assembled on the prebiotic earth to give rise to the origin of cellular life. So we decided to work with the simplest lipids we knew about, and those are fatty acids. Now, fatty acids have a long hydrocarbon chain uh, in our bodies that ranges from 14 to about 18 carbons in length, and there's an acidic group called car a carboxyl group at the end of the chain. And the fact is that soaps are made of fatty acids. So when you wash your hands with soap, you are using a fatty acid isolated from usually from various vegetable oils like palm oil and uh, sometimes from some certain animal fats, okay? So uh, soaps then are able to assemble into membranes. And we discovered that. Will Hargreave mixed up fatty acids or soaps under certain conditions, and he saw beautiful membranes under the microscope. So we published that in 1977 and 1978, and that was the first indication that maybe something as simple as a fatty acid could have been part of the very first membranes. But where did the fatty acids come from? Nobody knew. So I got to work on a, a meteorite called the Murchison meteorite, and some friends of mine at the NASA Ames Research Institute just over the hill from where I live, 
Uh, I live in Santa Cruz and I work at the University of California here. And just over the hill is NASA Ames Research Center. And in 1971, they got one of the first samples of the Murchison meteorite that fell in Australia in 1969. So just two years later, they had a chunk of this meteorite. And they analyzed it and they found lots of amino acids. And that was a big deal because Stanley Miller in 1953 said, well, amino acids can be just made from atmospheric components, but how could they be made on the early Earth? Well, uh, the amino acids were in the meteorite, so we know that amino acids probably were delivered to the early Earth just as they are today. All the time, every day, meteoritic material falls into the Earth's atmosphere and delivers organic compounds to the Earth. Now, four billion years ago, that was happening at a much greater rate. Thousands of times more stuff was coming in at the time that life was beginning. So my question was, did the meteorite contain fatty acids that could make membranes? So I got a sample of the meteorite. I extracted it just the same way that we extract lipids from living material. Uh, and I put the extract under the microscope, added some water, and watched. And as I watched, little membranous vesicles grew out of that dried droplet of meteoritic extract. So I published that in 1985 in Nature, and is the first indication that there really could have been membranes on the early Earth ready to get started uh, to make cellular life. So that was the story of how I got into this, because I had this question for my sabbatical. I had a wonderful grad student to work on it, and the two of us then discovered that fatty acid could make membranes. I then extracted, about uh, seven or eight years later, I extracted the Murchison meteorite, and we now know that it also has fatty acids that can make membranes. So uh, that is a very unique journey and a, and a very different kind of uh, story. Uh, so before we move forward, um, now I want to ask you about, uh, um, can you please tell me that what is the hot spring hypothesis for an origin of life? Can, can you please explain it to me? About so about the hot spring, keep in mind that forever people have said life began in the ocean. There's more water in the ocean than any place else on Earth. 99% of the Earth's water is in the ocean. And the rest of it right now, anyway, is tied up in the Antarctic ice cap and the Greenland ice cap. And then after that, you have a little tiny bit of fresh water in places like um, Lake Erie, the, you know, Lake Superior, Lake Michigan. These are the freshwater lakes here, left over from the glacial period, uh, you know, 11,000 years ago when the glaciers were coming, uh, were beginning to melt in uh, the North American continent. So there's not very much freshwater. So people simply never paid attention to freshwater, except for Charles Darwin. In 19, 1872, he wrote a letter to his friend, Joseph Hooker, and that letter has now become famous. He said in the letter, because he never published this, this was just in a letter, he was specula speculating, and he didn't like to speculate, but he did speculate in this letter. So he said to his friend Joseph Hooker, if, and oh, what a big if, there was a warm little pond with uh, nitrogen compounds and electricity and light and other forms of energy, maybe a protein could have been synthesized in that warm little pond. Now, he was not thinking about the ocean. He was thinking about the warm little ponds that were all over the English countryside, because that's, that's really what he had in mind. We have gotten back to that now. We found a number of reasons why the ocean environment is not such a good place. First of all, there are the only energy source is in hydrothermal vents. These were discovered in, in 1977 by Jack Corliss. He was diving in the Alvin to 
a, a deep portion of the ocean near the Galapagos Island, and he discovered the very first what we call black smokers. These are places where there's hot magma, hot rocks underneath it, and that heats the water, the water dissolves iron minerals, and that comes out as a black smoke. And as soon as he discovered that, everybody said to themselves, finally, here's a place in the ocean where there's energy available for life to begin. Maybe life began at these hydrothermal vents. So that was back in the you know, 1980s when the first papers came out. And all the way to now, 40 years later, that has been the paradigm. People have said life began in, in hot spring, I mean, in, uh, in these uh, vents, these hydrothermal vents, because there's just no place else in the ocean that there's any energy to drive those processes. So that's a hypothesis. Nobody has ever tested it by going down to the vents and putting in some, you know, some analytical stuff to be able to see whether it actually works in vents. What they have done, a few labs have tried to simulate vents, but they've never been able to simulate the pressure and the temperature and the conditions because, you know, that's hard to simulate. Uh, to, to, to do all that. So what we said is that maybe there's another place for life to begin, an alternative hypothesis. And we came up with the hot spring idea. Hot springs are on volcanic land masses. They are fresh water because they are fed by precipitation, mostly by rainfall, sometimes by snow melting, such as some of the places I visited. And uh, I began to think about this. And in about 2002, a Russian colleague of mine named Vladimir Kompanichenko, I happened to meet him at a meeting, a scientific meeting, and he said, why don't you come to Kamchatka and you can do some experiments there because we have hot springs all over the place in Kamchatka. It's one of the most volcanic sites on earth. So I went off to Kamchatka twice. I got funding from NASA to, for these trips, and uh, we had a number of other people along with us. And I did the first experiment in which I added organic compounds to a hot spring puddle, and suddenly it became clear. Those hot spring, that the components that I added were amino acids, a fatty acid that could make membranes, nucleobases that could make RNA and DNA, and phosphate and glycerol. These are all things that we think were available on the early earth. We would then sample that little boiling hot spring after a few minutes later, a few hours later, even several days later. And what I saw right away after adding this mixture is that membranous froth became apparent all around the edge of the pool. The pool was boiling in the center and little bubbly stuff was all around. And I knew that the fatty acid that I had added had made membranes, and those membranes were aggregated around the edge of the pool. And then I realized that that pool can dry out. And that means that everything is going to get concentrated as it dries out. And when you dry organic compounds out, they become much more reactive. They become very concentrated, and they begin to react with each other. So that was the nugget that I brought home from those hot spring experiments. I then began to do experiments in the laboratory. And I had a very wonderful postdoctoral worker named Suda Rajamani. She's now on the faculty at the University of Pune, just near Mumbai, in fact. And she needed a place to do some work. And I suggested that we try wet dry cycles to see if we could make nucleic acids from the nucleotides that we think might have been available on the early earth. Nucleotides are the monomers of nucleic acids. There's four of the monomers in RNA and the same four in DNA with one exception. Uh, in RNA, it's a thymine and in, uh, in uh, excuse me, in DNA, it's a thymine monophosphate and in RNA, it's a uridine monophosphate. So that's the only difference between RNA and DNA. The DNA is minus an oxygen. 
That's why it's called deoxyribonucleic acid. The RNA has an oxygen place. And that's kind of important, in fact, to know that. So we, got, we bought some uh, nucleotides and uh, Suda got to work. We built a little chamber that we could do wet dry cycles and we began to analyze them by gel electrophoresis. We saw nucleic acids appearing. We were able to synthesize nucleic acids, RNA, all the way up to 100 nucleotides in length, just by putting it through wet dry cycles. And if a lipid was present, those polymers got encapsulated in vesicles. And we can see them in the vesicles because we get out a stain a fluorescent stain that stains the, the RNA or the DNA so that we can see it under the microscope. Nobody believed it. We sent it off and we finally got it published. But there's tremendous skepticism because all of our colleagues say, it can't be that easy. That's too simple. All you have to do is wet and dry. No, life began in solution with all kinds of other chemistry, metabolism and this and that. So we're still trying to convince people that this is a good idea. We have convinced a few people. Nick Hud is at uh, Georgia Tech, decided to try it. He used wet dry cycles and he got proteins to be synthesized, peptides that he could not get in solution, but just wet dry cycles and suddenly it begins to work. Other people have written to me, they're trying to do it as well. Marie-Christine Morel uh, decided to try it at her laboratory in Paris. One of her grad students, and I was on her uh, committee, named Laura De Silva, got it to work in Paris. So this is just now starting to be interesting to other people because it's such a simple idea and because we get the products in what we call a protocell. So that's the gist of the hot spring hypothesis. In fresh water on volcanic land masses, there are wet dry cycles. Those wet dry cycles can drive polymer synthesis. We demonstrated that, by the way, by going to New Zealand. And just this year, early this year, we ran an experiment where we saw the same polymers showing up when we did those wet dry cycles using hot spring water and hot spring uh, uh, temperatures in uh, a place called Hills Gate in New Zealand. So we're pretty sure that we're on the right track and we hope that other people will try it out and see for themselves instead of just saying, oh, that's too simple. Okay, so that's the hot spring hypothesis. There is a very small community of scientists who are working on original five. Um, I must say that thank you for being one of those scientists one of those individuals who are working on the origin of life. The fact that we have, we, now we have a testable hypothesis for the origin of life, that is actually very wonderful and, and, a, and a, a huge step towards understanding the origin of life. So my next question is that we know that when life started on Earth, right? We know we have evidences and we have uncovered that chapter of origin of life. We know that the rough estimate is like 3.5 billion years ago, life might have started, we know. And that, that number is actually well supported by fossils and radiometric metric dating. But how, how life started is much more less understood. No one is, no one is really sure about that, how life actually started in the first place. And many scientists are actually trying to understand this question. In comparison to the central dogma or the theory of evolution, Hypotheses about life origin are much more hypothetical, right? No one is sure which hypothesis is correct or if the correct hypothesis is out there waiting for, uh, waiting to be discovered, right? Only a few hundred people around the world that have the resources to work on this. So we have come up to the edge of our knowledge and that's very exciting for a scientist because science is about questions. It's not about stuff that you read about in the textbook. That's sort of the ashes that uh, are left behind as the, that, as the fire of science goes by, because science is driven by questions. So we have these two big questions. Did life begin in salt water uh, or did it become, begin in fresh water? So I told you about our idea of the hot spring hypothesis and we're testing it. 
So a hypothesis is a good hypothesis if it can be submitted for experimental testing. You can't just dream up ideas and sort of uh, write them down and send them off for publication. A lot of people do that, by the way, but it's not the way I like to do science. I like to prove myself wrong by doing experiments because ideas are a dime a dozen. Everybody has ideas. Only a few of them are going to be good ideas, but you can't tell the difference between a good idea and a bad idea until you test it. So you want to get rid of all the bad ideas as soon as possible. So you try to prove yourself wrong. And that was um, first written about by Karl Popper. He was a philosopher of science, and he came up with the idea that the only good hypothesis is one that can be falsified. Now that's very different than what we usually think about. Usually we like to prove our hypothesis is correct. And that's kind of dangerous because you fall in love with your hypothesis and you want to prove that you're right. It's better to try to prove that you're wrong because then you can get rid of all the bad ideas before you publish and you only save those gems, those nuggets of good ideas that have passed testing. So as I say, we have this basic question, salt water or fresh water? That's, that's, yeah. that's now subject to experimental testing. Everything beyond that is for the most part speculation. So I'm gonna to have to speculate now, and I try to label it when I was speculating because a speculation can turn into an idea over time because everybody kind of likes to make guesses and then you speculate about the guess and you uh, uh, see if you can figure out a way to turn a speculation into a hypothesis. So I'm gonna tell you where we are now uh, in our testing. In the hypothesis that we've now published just this year in astrobiology, and I think I sent that to you, did I send you our hot spring article? Yes, you did. Okay, good. So you know about that. So yes. in it, we speculate that all of these protocells that are formed by this wet tricycling, they're formed by vast numbers. We talk about trillions of protocells. Well, that's the number of protocells in a little test tube. What about the entire Earth's surface and all the volcanoes emerging? It's a much larger sort of a landscape for doing these kinds of natural experiments. Now the protocells are not alive. They're all different. None of them has figured out yet. None of them have the properties that let them take the next step in evolution. And the next step in our opinion is that some of the protocells will have polymers, encapsulated polymers, that stabilize the membrane. Because these are little microscopic soap bubbles, and you know how unstable a soap bubble is. If you poke a soap bubble, it's gone. Well, these little membranes are like that. They're just basically microscopic soap bubbles. So there had to be some way to stabilize them. Now, all life today has stabilizing proteins called cytoskeletal elements and these line the uh, the interior surface of red blood cells for example and they stabilize for four months it gets squeezed in a in a cap capillary and it uh, then sort of uh, gets uh, expands again when it gets through the capillary and so um, uh, it has to be stabilized so we think that the first test evolutionary test of cells the first cells that are not alive yet is to stabilize it with polymers that are synthesized by a random process. Rabia, okay, so what's the next evolutionary step? We stabilize these cells so they can survive wet dry. What's the next step? We think it might be that some of those uh, polymers produce a porosity in the cell membrane because the, this protocell has to find a way to get nutrients inside and to get rid of waste products. So there's gotta be little nanoscopic holes in the membrane called pores. So we think that now we have a stable protocell that has pores. And finally, we can get to the next step, 
where metabolism begins. Because now that there's a way for stuff outside to get in, there is a third level that begins when you have catalytic polymers, such as enzymes. So we think that a few of, of these rare protocells not only are stable, but have a pore in them, but they happen to have some sort of a polymer. It might be RNA, it might be simple peptides, maybe even a complex of RNA with peptides, but those polymers have a enzymatic capacity. They can catalyze metabolic reactions. So little by little, these protocells learn how to bring stuff in that can make more polymers. You see? So we're stepping our way up in evolution from the simplest to more and more complex. Catalysts are a big step in complexity. We really don't know how catalysts could have started up. We simply assume, uh, we speculate that there had to be a first catalyst that could do metabolic reactions, okay? So now we got all the way up to something that is partly alive. It's stable, it has pores, it can make chemical changes in stuff that comes in from the outside. And maybe those changes can turn into a monomer that can be part of a polymer inside. The last step toward life is how to use genetic information. And this is entirely speculation. We imagine that maybe some of those nucleic acids happen to be able to interact with peptides that are also being produced, and that interaction allowed the nucleic acid to help the peptide get synthesized. Suddenly, we have a, what amounts to a primitive gene. Those cells will be selected because they are making a peptide faster than any other cells can do accident got into the system when a nucleic acid happened to learn happened to be able one sequence to another sequence the, the, the RNA sequence to the peptide sequence okay that's as far as we've gotten in our thinking uh, there's so many questions left that's I that's here I gave a whole chapter over to things we don't know. And this is one of them. We really don't know how the genome trained, and we don't know where ribosomes came from. Uh, we know they had to be a primitive version of a ribosome, but we really don't know because that is the protein synthesis machine that is part of all life today. You put all of that together, and finally, you have a first form of life, something we call LUCA, the last universal common ancestor. And that's what made those fossils that you talked about, the fossil stromatolites, about 3.5 billion years ago. Those were advanced life, those were bacteria. We think that half a billion years before that, four billion years ago, there was an ocean, there were volcanoes, there were hot springs, at that point, probably all of these natural experiments were giving rise to the first primitive forms of life. Yes, that is excellent. And I think it takes a lot of courage to, to select such one complex uh, field and then to address one of the most mysterious questions that humanity has ever asked, that how did life might have originated in the first place? because these ideas are very complex and they are very philosophical. When we address this question in the philosophical term, they are easy to understand. We always find a way to, you know, satisfy ourselves or our curiosity. But in terms of science, it's very difficult to understand. And I know that you are very dedicated and you have been working on Origin of Life for more than 40 years. And I met Dr. Bruce back in 2017 and he told me that you two used to meet every day to discuss the region of life. Is that right? And I have another question that how Dr. Bruce and you decided to work together 
on origin of life. So the word serendipity comes from a mythological, two mythological princes who were the princes of serendip, which was uh, probably part of what is now Thailand. Uh, the princes of serendip went through their life and they had stories about them. This is all fictional, of course. And one, just by chance, as they went through life, they kept finding two unrelated things that happened to come together perfectly. So they just went through life and time and again, they had a lucky coincidence. So we call that serendipity. Bruce Damer and I met by serendipity. He happened to live nearby, it's about half an hour drive from where I live. He lives in a place called Boulder Creek, and I live in uh, a place called Bonnie Dune, which is uh, a few miles north of Santa Cruz. So uh, Bruce happened to know uh, Rebecca Braslow, who's a, a faculty member in the chemistry department. And Rebecca knows my wife, Olaf, who is also a professor of chemistry. And of course, that means that Rebecca knew me because uh, Olaf and I are a couple. So Rebecca said, knowing Bruce and knowing me, she said to herself, these two guys have got to meet. So she invited us to a, her home for dinner. And sure enough, Bruce and I, uh, it was just like a, two puzzle pieces that fit together perfectly to make a bigger piece of the puzzle. And Bruce has a background in computer science he was a NASA contractor who worked on space missions. He had designed uh, missions having to do with asteroid capture and things like that. But he had a lifelong interest, interest going back to his uh, teen years in how life began. And he had his own ideas that he had developed in his head as a teenager. So he was primed to work on the origin of life. And when we met, which would have been about uh, 2010, uh, I've been working on the original life for 30 years by that time. So, uh, and I had uh, grant funding from NASA and uh, funding from National Science Foundation. So I had a laboratory and was actively working on the origin of life by experimentation. Bruce is not an experimentalist. He likes being part of experiments, but he doesn't uh, do them himself out of his head. He is a computer scientist and he loves to make computer programs that simulate life. And that was his PhD thesis, by the way, was developing a computer program that could simulate some of the chemical reactions uh, having to do with the origin of life. So we began to talk and uh, we got more and more involved with each other's lives. And uh, I began to uh, do research that he could take part in. Uh, for instance, uh, we uh, had a trip that we could both do to the Australian Pilbara region, where these uh, ancient fossils, three and a half billion years old, uh, were uh, uh, present. And we both went on that trip, that was probably about four summers ago now, and uh, that's when we really connected, because we've been developing these ideas and on this field trip, we are invited to give a sort of an informal lecture to the Australian scientists that were along with the trip. One of them was Martin van Kranendonk, and he was a guide for this trip to the Pilbara. And he had a graduate student named Tara Jokic, and she was working in these, this fossil field uh, called the Dresser Formation which is uh, in this faraway part of Western Australia. So uh, Martin listened carefully to Bruce and my ideas. And he took me aside later, as did um, uh, uh, other scientists along on the trip, particularly Malcolm Walter, who had discovered these fossils in the 1980s. And they said that we have some ideas that you need to hear because Tara Jokic, as part of her PhD thesis, discovered a mineral called geyserite. And that could only have been made by freshwater geysers. 
in the Pilbara region. The Pilbara, by the way, is an ancient volcanic craton. It used to be a volcano. Uh, now what's left of it is something over 100 miles wide and little hot springs, ancient hot springs. that are now extinct, of course, but they've left these fossils behind. So that really rang a bell. And uh, Tara and uh, Martin and I decided that we needed to make, do a, a public uh, our article on this. So we wrote to Scientific American and they said, yes, we'd love to have an article about that. And in the August of 2017 issue, we had a cover article that for the first time brought all of these eyes together for people to read for themselves. In the article, Bruce Damer had a major role because he was the guy that thought of what comes next after life begins. What are some of the first evolutionary steps? So that was his contribution to the article. And there was a beautiful um, a diagram of the hot spring hypothesis that was done by Scientific American artists. So anybody that wants to now can read about our adventures with Martin and Tara in the uh, Pilbara and can also read about how that gave rise to the hot spring hypothesis. That is so wonderful that people, I actually want to inspire people by using these interviews that how people from different backgrounds, like you have a background in chem chemistry and Dr. Bruce has a background in computer, computer science and Tara has a background in geology, can come together and work uh, and can address the question that is puzzling people from God knows how many years. <laughs> You'll be um, interested to hear You'll be interested to hear that Bruce, for years, had a company in Pakistan, in Islamabad. Yes, I know. Yes, I went you, to... You knew that, okay. Yeah, so he's, he's bowed out of that company now, uh, but he was that part of his computer science background. Yes, yes. I, I, I actually met Dr. Bruce back in 2017. He was in Pakistan. Yeah. So I went to Islamabad. I live in Lahore, but I went to see him in Islamabad. And he yeah. also invited me to visit his uh, company. And I met a couple of his colleagues as well. And it was wonderful to see that, that he's working in Pakistan as well. Well, if you don't mind my saying so, I think that you are the next generation of scientists after Bruce and me. All you need is the passion that you've got, the interest in the question, and then that will guide your life. You've heard this metaphor you have wind in your sails. So that wind, your passion and that interest is going to guide you through your life. And all you have to do is to let go and let it carry you along. So I want to encourage you with what you're doing and the fact that I hear from you that you have this uh, uh, tr deep interest in these uh, fundamental questions of biology. I hope that you do continue. That is actually very kind of you to say that. that um, I'm actually, uh, people like you, Dr. Bruce and Tara, were the main inspiration for me to keep doing what I'm doing right now. And I'm just, you know, I have just started my journey and I'm so glad that you and Dr. Bruce and Tara are part of my, are the, the part of my journey. And the, and the thing that all of you are there for me all the time, <laughs> Is very wonderful. I am very thankful and grateful for that. Thank you so much for taking our time and being part of my small project. Take care, Dr. Darian. Bye bye. Good enough. Thanks for having me.